My name, as Ruth said, is Annie Barrow, and I work at Denver Botanic Gardens as the manager of horticulture outreach programs. And I'm so excited to be talking to you today um, about waterwise landscape horticulture from our region, Western region. Um, a little bit about what I do. Uh, basically, my job is to educate, promote, and assist um, in the achievement of waterwise landscaping. Um, by consulting on plant selection, by talking about horticultural practices and maintenance and irrigation. Um, and I do this for both public and private sector. So I work with municipalities and parks departments, but I also work with landscape architects. And then obviously um, it's important at the gardens for us to reach out to our community members and do um, lecture series like this um, with the city of Greeley. So some examples of um, what we've done um, just this last June, a uh, year ago, we did a mile long median. If you're in Lakewood, Colorado, you can go to Colfax and Kipling, drive west, and you will see a, a median that was installed last year. And our goal there is to turn the irrigation completely off in three years. The plants we put in there should be able to thrive and survive with no supplemental water on a regular basis. Um, the same idea was done in Greenwood Village, and that is actually uh, was just put in this season. We did three miles long of a median um, down by 25 all the way out to university. So um, in those instances, we work with the cities. Um, I've also, we are a regional program, so we do get outside of Denver and we want to help people throughout our region because we all share the same climate. Um, so we, we actually went out to Cortez, Colorado, which is out by Durango, and worked with CDOT and their city to help them um, with their planting design as well. And they don't have any irrigation, so that was a really tricky, tricky landscape design. So um, why do we need this? I think there's um, a really interesting thing happening in Denver. First of all, I think there's a lot of folks that aren't from Colorado that have come here and when they think of Colorado, these are the sort of images that they think about. And, and I'm guilty. I am from the Midwest. And I certainly pictured, you know, the, the skiing and the snow and the, and the beautiful aspens. But the trick about that is, is that, you know, Colorado has at least five different um, climates within the state itself because of our elevation. And so down here where we are on the Front Range, our climate is really not at all like what you see um, as it is promoted to tourists. Um, and even those that live here and are lifelong Coloradans um, sometimes just don't think about it um, and think about how dry we are. But as an example, um, so we live in what we call a steppe climate. Um, and that really just means that we're in a very semi-arid region um, with very low precipitation and we're next to the mountains, right? We're the front range. And compared to say Chicago or New York, and I think this might be a little hard to read on this slide, but New York gets 50 inches of precipitation a year. We get 15.6 on average. That is a really big difference. And so, you know, we really need to think about how, if we got, five inches less, we'd be actually in an arid environment, also known as a desert. That would be Tucson. Eight to 10 inches of rain is a desert climate, an arid climate. So we are in a semi-arid region. And so we need to really practice water conservation because it is a rare, it's a resource out here that's limited. And also um, there's a couple other things about being in a steppe climate that make us unique. So we are technically a zone five. Um, Horticultural zones are determined by the lowest and the coldest temperature that a plant can withstand without, um, without dying. So we are a zone five. And I went to school in Purdue, uh, Purdue University in Indiana, and worked in Chicago for some time. And they're a zone five too. But I'll tell you how different the, uh, the gardening practices are. Um, out here in the steppe, out here out west, we get very little precipitation, but it's also extremely dry. It's not nearly as humid as it is um, in, in the Midwest or the East Coast. 
we're much higher up in elevation, so the UV is really intense on our plants. Um, as we've just uh, experienced, I think on Monday it was 35 degrees, so we get really wide temperature swings, both during the summer, spring, and even in winter, where we have days that reach above 40, well above 40. Um, our soil is very different out here. Um, we have a much leaner profile, less hummus and less rich um, organic matter. A lot of our snows can be heavy and break branches um, and wet. And of course, none of us are strangers to hail, which can wreak havoc on a garden. So that said, um, when we look at zone five somewhere else, say the Midwest or the East Coast or even the South, it's a humid environment. They get 40 plus inches of rain, lots of cloudy days. Um, so the sun isn't quite as intense. The temperatures are extreme, but they're extreme and they kind of stick to their seasons, right? So we don't have 60 degree winter days back in say Ohio. Um, and then the soil is, is very, very different makeup because it's forested land. So there's a lot of plant debris that gets recycled into the soil and the soil is very rich and humus uh, fill. So all zone five plants are not created equal is the bottom line there. So um, that can be tough because you say, you know, well, what do we have, what do we have to do here? I guess how do we how do we solve that? And a lot of folks say, well, we're gonna just zero escape. This is what they think of. Rocks. My job is to turn this perception around. And that's why I call this a waterwise landscape lecture, because this is not what a great waterwise landscape looks like, potentially. We do see people doing this where you have maybe a few junipers and it's mainly a lot of gravel, but we don't have to settle for this and we shouldn't because there's some wonderful plants that we can grow here that, um, that actually thrive here and wouldn't grow in the Midwest. And we have our own very special aesthetic. For example, these are two xeriscapes. And now believe it or not, the garden on the left, the picture on the left is the Rhodes Water Smart Garden at Denver Botanic Gardens. And that is pictured sometime in June. And you can see color, texture, um, interest that would stay up in winter even. It's a very colorful and beautiful landscape that maybe gets watered, you know, once every two weeks. Um, now these plants are established, but we're always adding more plants in. And so this is a very low water garden where we are not watering it weekly or multiple times a week at all. And the garden on the right doesn't get any supplemental water. This is a garden out in Lakewood, Colorado. It's called Kendrick Lake. Um, and I believe again, that's out in, on Kipling and I wanna say Garrison. Um, you, can, you can Google that and it's a pretty large public park that's open right now. And the city takes care of it. So they, the garden on the left, we know all the horticulturists at, T, at Denver Botanic Gardens are in there helping. But this is a city managed garden, so there's less resources put to it, but it's still very colorful. Um, it's been established some 10 years now, and it wasn't watered supplementally at all last year, which is pretty amazing. So we can do better, and I'm here to show you how. Um, and one of the things that um, I do in my job is I mentioned a couple of medians. Is I, I pick the hardest place possible to plant out in one of an already harsh environment for plants. So uh, I do work with a lot of medians and then also right of ways, which people often call hell strips. Um, you know, there it is a tough environment because on top of um, what we've already talked about with the UV and the aridity and low um, precipitation, you've got urban heat island issues. And even if you're a residential gardener in a city, you're still facing some of the things like compacted soils and salt and, and that sort of thing and pollution. So um, we really, we, we have to really design according to that. And so I, I like to choose plants that frankly thrive on neglect. Um, once they get in there, I want them to really just survive and be looking good. And I don't want to have to do everything to keep them going because we have other things in our lives. So 
Um, that said, before I get to talking about the plants that thrive on neglect or the plants that really do well here, I want to talk about a really important part of gardening that a lot of people don't think about. And that would be soils, which is the other half of the plant that we don't see, but it is critical. And one of the things that I'm finding is um, people are, tend to use the same practices that we would use out in the Midwest or in the East Coast to amend the soil. And that unfortunately just doesn't work for our region. And there are several reasons why. But what I have been promoting and what uh, the, the gardens has taught me and all the hundreds of years of experience of horticulturists that I work with, you know, have shared with me is it's all about drainage. And so our plants really need excellent drainage. There is a product called squeegee. Now I had never heard of this product until I came to, to Colorado, but this is a wonder product. And essentially it's, you can see the picture there. It's a, a rock or a gravel, almost like the size of pea gravel. It has a little bit of crushed fines in it, um, but it does a, a number of things that helps the plants that we wanna grow here. And I'm gonna get to telling you why exactly that works. This can be purchased in bulk and it can be found at special retail nurseries. I've not seen it much at you know, Walmart or Home Depot or that sort of thing, but um, specialty nurseries and um, retail garden centers that are home, uh, that are mom and pop owned will typically have something like this available. So for example, um, I mentioned back here the 50-50 mix. So what I prescribe typically, especially for a median, um, but when you're doing a large scale project, I prescribe a 50-50 mix of either existing soil and or topsoil with 50% squeegee. Now, when we did the project, this is Lakewood on Colfix Avenue. This is, we actually dug 12 inches down, you can see. I don't know if you could see my mouse, but we dug 12 inches down, removed all that soil, and had a truck put it all in for us because it's really heavy, hard work. And that's me and the guys out there placing plants. Uh, this is what makes turning the water off possible. Um, why does squeegee work? Why, does, why is drainage so important? Um, well, there's a couple things. So water will sink into the ground when you water a plant. Rather than being absorbed by the wood mulch it might typically put down, that water is going to actually be able to penetrate the soil and get to the roots of the plant. And that way the water's not being held at the crown of that plant and that plant is going to rot away if there's water up at the top of it. Um, xeric plants, plants that like dry heat in our environment and our climate and native plants, they don't want a lot of water at their roots and they'll suffer for it. Um, furthermore, um, the, the water um, that would be held by the mulch mulch is typically a dark brown color, well, it would probably be held and then evaporate rather quickly because it is so dry here. So if it gets down into the ground beneath the level that's exposed to sun, there's more water held to for the plant. And lastly, the, the color of it, you can see in the back of that picture towards the back, that's the color of the squeegee and there's the mixture of both topsoil and squeegee. But the squeegee can be used as mulch and then it reflects light because it's a lighter color and that, that eases the, the stress on the plant. So squeegee has multiple um, benefits and it really is a, a great solution. And now I'm not saying um, there aren't other things there. You could use crushed granite, you could use any other kind of crushed rock, but squeegee is what I found to be commercially available and works really well. And here you can see, um, we want to mimic what's happening in our environment. And on the left here, we see a penstemon, penstemon covea. And you can see from that picture how rocky the soil is. This is just out in the natural setting. And on the right, that's a cultivated version of a penstemon. That's coral baby penstemon. But you can see that it's been mulched with rock and it's a very happy plant. So really all we're doing is 
just listening and paying attention to what's really happening and working naturally in our area. And instead of fighting what we have, we're working with it. Instead of trying to change the soil to be rich and deep and, and have lots of water in our gardens, we can work with what we're, we've been given. So um, I think that's really important that we, we mimic what we see in nature. Now, one thing, um, I'm gonna get to talking about some plants here. Um, one thing that's really cool about being out west is uh, self-sowing is, uh, is, is an actual possibility out here. Um, as I said, I landscaped in Chicago for about 10 years and you couldn't get something to self-sow because it was so wet and moist and things would rot out, the seedling would rot out. But here, there's a lot of really nice plants that will um, self-sow in your garden and that are native and not invasive. Um, and they also, they, they fill a spot. If you have a plant die and you say plant Rocky Mountain Penstemon and it self-sows, it could fill that spot where maybe another plant didn't do so well. But moreover, that plant, it knows where it wants to grow and it knows where the seed takes is where it's gonna be happy. So you're know, you know that it's already like ensured success for that plant. Um, from the top, left to right, we're looking at moon carrot. Um, this is a plant select plant I'll talk about in detail a little bit later. This middle one is retibita, which is a native plant um, that self sows. On the right, the ball, the purple balls, that's an allium or an, an ornamental onion, and there are many different varieties of those. Some are um, hybridized, so they are uh, sterile. Others do self sow and can be um, aggressive. So you want to think about if you are going to use plants that self-sow, you have to think about where you're putting that plant and where it might sow. Um, down here on the left is the Rocky Mountain Penstemon, which is a native. Um, so, and then we've got uh, a poppy here in the center. And all of these plants are really pollinator friendly too, which is another advantage. And then on the far right here, we're looking at a columbine, which is of course our state flower. So. Just some thoughts on using some, some plants that are really easy and will take it dry and um, make their way into your garden. This is that moon carrot here that we saw back here. Um, this is a plant select plant. And I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about plant select. I know um, Ruth mentioned Ross Shrigley is gonna speak to um, plant select. He's the executive director of that program and he'll tell you all, all the more about it, but I've got some plant select um, information to share with you today too. So. Really cool plant here, um, really nice pale um, sort of turquoise leaf, almost looks like a carrot um, foliage. Um, and it's got a beautiful pink and white flower. Now this is a biennial, so you will not get a flower in it the first year. Um, but this is something that I have in my garden and I let sow. It is not invasive. Here's a couple of onions or alliums and a lot of people are familiar with the large, large headed allium. I think it's called um, just the giant. Um, that one really seeds a lot um, and it can be a bit aggressive. So if you like gardening, you don't mind being out there and pulling what you don't want. That's a good plant. But there's a new uh, plant, perennial plant of the year called allium millennium. And that is a hybrid. So it wouldn't self sow if you didn't want it to. And then we've got uh, the drumstick allium here in the middle. That's a totally different uh, species. So it's Allium spherocephalum. And then on the far right is a really cool plant. Um, it is Allium altaicum, much harder to find in the industry, but you can come see it at our step garden as it's from South Africa. So we talked about zone five being different out here and back um, in, you know, East, side of the country. And one of the issues I think that I see often is, is folks sometimes really love plants that just aren't going to do well here. Maybe they grew up with a lilac tree or they grew up with hydrangeas at their home or they make you know a certain plant a rose or makes you think of someone you love and you want to grow that plant. Or maybe when you think of Xeriscape you think of that rock scheme you think of just junipers and cactus and you're turned off by it and you're just not wanting to do a zero escape. What do we do then? Well, I worked with uh, a local de de developer and builder to design some options for people 
that wouldn't really necessarily say they wanted a zero escape, but they might want one and not know it. And this is how I mean. There are a lot of traditional low water garden plants that we can grow in our area, in our climate, that will look beautiful and look lush and will do just as well in, in the Midwest as they will do here, that are a lot tougher than you realize. So I'm just gonna go over a few of those plants. Uh, and most of them are gonna be perennials here. So here we see a picture of lavender and there's all sorts of cultivars and varieties of lavender. Real easy to grow, blooms from May through October. On the right, we've got a peony and you'd be surprised at how tough peonies are. If you haven't grown them out here, they are really drought tolerant once they're established. And certain peonies are more so than others, um, but there's plenty of varieties and, and cultivars of peonies as well. Another couple of plants that are, are really traditional and popular would be uh, the perennial geranium on the left that also blooms in May through October. Um, it is um, a beautiful, tidy looking plant that also has fall color. And then on the right there, you see two dianthus and also known as carnations. Um, those grow ex very well out here. And you can see on that top picture with the light pink, those leaves are sort of silvery gray. And you'll notice that there's a theme with xeric plants where silver foliage and their very small fine leaves like that does very well out here. And that is because the silver foliage will reflect some of that heat and light. And the fact that those leaves are small makes them much less susceptible to hail. A couple other traditional plants that, um, you know, how can you not love an iris? We have an iris garden dedicated to iris and daylilies at the Botanic Gardens. And there's so many different bloom colors and re-blooming iris. They're extremely, extremely tough plants. There you see next to the iris are some chives, which is another herb you can have next to your lavender, really easy to grow um, and a tough plant. And then on the, on the bottom, that might be something you're not as familiar with, but it is, it is often used in country um, cottage gardens. It's called armeria and it's known as sea thrift. Um, and it's got a nice pink, white and red flower and sort of a similar foliage to the chives there where it's sort of a, a grassy foliage. Uh, a few more here, Coreopsis does excellent out here. And it's a very traditional garden plant that you would see in, in most uh, English gardens and borders. There on the right on the top is sedum, which is almost like a succulent plant. It'll do well in almost any garden unless it gets too much water. Lots of different varieties and cultivars. You can get them where they stand up tall to be 18 to 24 inches, and you can get sedum where it's just a ground cover and it's only four inches tall. Then the plant in front of that there, you, you may not may, may know this plant. It's very common around here. It's, it's lamb's ear, but it's, its genus is called stachys. And that genus has actually uh, got a ton of different species that are really wonderful. Now this plant here, it can be uh, vigorous. So you'd want to make sure, almost like the self-sowing, where, where you plant when you plant a plant that you know is going to be vigorous like that, you, you should think about whether you want to put a steel edge border to stop it from escaping the bed, or if you want to put it in your right of way between the sidewalk and the road where it can't escape and it will just grow vigorously for you and where a lot of things won't grow. So actually, I think it's a great right of way plant. Um, yarrow here, we've got the yellow yarrow and then the pink. Um, that's also known as Achillea. This is a native uh, genus and it's a wonderful plant that can be grown um, with very little water and it has a lot of staying power. It has a winter interest, comes in lots of different heights and sizes, um, typically blooms June, July, August, maybe even to, to September. And then this plant behind it is absolutely fabulous. It's a globe thistle. And it is not like the thistle that is the weed in your yard. It has a completely different um, genus. Echinops is the genus. There's a quite a few different cultivars of this plant, but it's actually pretty tough and really likes the drought. Um, and we have quite a bit of it in our perennial border garden at the gardens. And real nice winter interest and in architecture on both of these plants. So when everything goes down, you still have the seed heads and the flower heads that stay up in winter. They give you something to look at in your garden. 
And lastly, for when we're talking about traditional garden plants, you cannot leave out the viburnum. Um, Michael Durr is one of my favorite horticulturists uh, of all time, and, and he's a lover of viburnums and he's made me into one. Now, viburnums are great because they're really a multi, it's all season plant. It blooms in the spring, it has a berry in the summer, the birds can eat it. Uh, in the fall, it has beautiful fall color, and then it's a shrub. So, and it's actually a shrub with a really sizable leaf for the plant, as far as plants go out here, it's got a pretty broad leaf. Um, there are two pictured here, um, Allegheny and Mini Man. These are plant select viburnums. There are dozens and dozens of species of viburnums, but these two have been specifically tested to do extremely well in our climate out west. So some of the other viburnums that you might find that you will do better over in the Midwest, um, but these two are tried and true and they're a wonderful addition to any garden. The last thing I want to talk about is turf when we're talking about traditional gardens. Everybody likes to have turf and I understand. People want, you know, your children to grow up on the grass and throw the ball or you might have a dog. I mean, I, usually I, when I give this speech, I, I ask how many people, raise your hand if you have a dog. Does anybody want to raise their hand if they have a dog? I'm in Colorado, so you, so you probably have a dog and a Subaru, right? Maybe 80% of you. <laughs> um, I'm just kidding. So, but a lot of people do have dogs and they're a wonderful animal to have, but it can wreak havoc on your lawn. And if you didn't know, Kentucky bluegrass, which is typically what um, sod is when it goes in or um, what they put into most lawns, uh, requires, requires a, probably about 25 inches of water per season. And right here you can see, so this is dog tough. And dog tough grass is a type of grass that um, you wouldn't, if you're not, if you're looking at it from afar, it looks just as green and lush as any other grass. It's not a lot like the grandma grass or the buffalo grass, which are our native grasses that are a little bit thinner looking. They don't um, take to traffic as well. This is a wonderful grass for any yard where you're gonna have kids running around or you wanna just be outside and have your feet on the ground and, and go barefoot in the grass when if you have a dog. Now, this is a warm season grass and it, it does require full sun, but really that's about it. You, once you get it established, you won't need to water it all season. So the first two years you'll need to water it. And then once it's established, you're done. There's no more watering. And in fact, you don't have to mow it if you don't want to, because it won't continue to grow past about six or eight inches. So you, if you want a longer look, that's okay. So whatever dog you have, um, whatever dog you might have, I actually have a cat, so I threw a cat in the picture. But if you have a dog, you can have wonderful grass. And that's my last one. <laughs> and this is really, you know, this is really where we, I'd like to see folks think about using dog tough is in these very urban areas where we all wanna take our dogs out for a walk and we may not wanna to go to the dog park, so we'll just walk around or we'll go to the grocery store with our dog. And, and then what happens is, you know, things, the existing turf ends up looking like in this picture as it does. And it's just, and it won't recover. So if we were to plant dog tuff there, I would guarantee you that that would still be green grass, despite all the dogs going all by, you know, by it every day. And this is, you know, some abstract picture of downtown, but, you know, I used to live in Capitol Hill and I could vouch for the fact for their need of dog tuff grass. So think about that if you're doing a conversion and want to save, save water. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about plant select um, and talk a little bit more about plants. And um, I'm going to start with perennials. We'll talk about a little few shrubs and then some trees and then I'll take some questions. So the first thing I want to talk about when we talk about plants is plant select. And I, I wish I could pull you on how many people have, have heard of Plant Select, but hopefully you have. Um, it is a collaboration between Denver Botanic Gardens and um, Colorado State University, uh, where we partner to test and trial plants to see how well they will perform in our particular environment. So we've got over 150 plants. We add new plants every year. 
Um, so this book here was sort of my, my gardening plant Bible the first uh, year or two that I was gardening here in, in Colorado. The plants here are really great for beginner gardeners, for fo folks that want to try xeriscaping but haven't tried it before, or just people that maybe haven't had a green thumb in the past, but we've already done all the work for you, which is great about this. Um, we've, we've tested, this has a picture here of a plant select garden, um, but we've already done the work so that, you know, you can essentially choose almost any of these plants, put them in your garden and know that they've been tested for drought and invasiveness and disease and they've, they've succeeded in past muster. So they got into the program. Um, so there's criteria they must meet. They're available all over um, our region. You can see here all the states they're in. And um, a great resource is actually just going to the Plant Select website. Um, if you don't wanna buy the book on Amazon, um, and you certainly don't have to because all of this is available online. So it's plantselect.org, just like it's spelled, .org. And you can look through all sorts of plants. They have planting designs you can download, um, some of which I'm working on updating. So you'll have some new planting designs to choose from. Um, and they'll have all sorts of information on the, how to maintain the plant and um, what, what this plant is best for and, and, and that sort of thing. So um, really encourage you um, to check out Plant Select. Um, the perennials, as I said, they're all trialed and tested and they're tested for um, all of the, you know, the challenges we face in our environment. And here you can see pictures of our facilities where we have our trial gardens. So up at CSU, we have a trial garden where we test plants and people are constantly you know, checking off the list on the things that they meet or do not meet. And then we also have um, a trial garden down in Chatfield at our satellite um, ranch for Denver Botanic Gardens. And then just a, a note of where you can, you could find out all this online, but I just wanted to let you know that there's several, um, Folks here at uh, Pope Farms Produce and Garden Center. Looks like they carry the plant select. There may be other folks that aren't listed here. This, um, I didn't recently update uh, this list. Um, there's also online vendors, but um, you can certainly find them, the plant select plants in and around our area. And I encourage you to uh, look for the tag and then you'll know that you're buying a good tough plant that's been tested and tried and true. So um, one, one thing that I guess is a bit of a pet peeve of mine is when I see folks planting things that have been overplanted, that have just been 20 years, they're always on the plant list, you know, they're always in the garden. Um, and these plants, that that's okay for the places where they don't need extra water, but here these plants do need water. So here I'm showing you Estella de Oro daylily. Daylilies are okay, and, and some of them are actually tougher than others, but this is just a yellow flowering plant that blooms all summer. And here's another yellow flowering plant that blooms all summer. It's Rudbeckia. It's probably Goldstrom, I think it's a picture of, which is um, uh, uh, Black-Eyed Susan, sorry. Uh, Black-Eyed Susan. These are two plants that are often used in, in gardens, and I want to I want to inform you that there are some great alternatives that require much less water much less maintenance, you don't have to amend the soil, and they still give you a yellow bloom all through the season. So a daylily that Stella de Oro will bloom from late May or early June through October, and the uh, Rudbeckia and or Black-Eyed Susan will bloom in July, August, September. So just a few plants that you could use instead. Um, how about, this is another Black-Eyed Susan um, that is an annual but it will reseed. And this is a plant select plant. And you can see it looks very much like this, but much more tolerant of drought. Here's another plant through plant select. It's called the chocolate flower. Awesome plant, smells like chocolate. Who wouldn't love this plant? I love it. Um, a, a nonstop bloomer, May through October. Um, Engelmann stacy. This is an industrial strength plant. It is so tough. You couldn't kill it if you tried. I mean, I'm not saying that it's invasive, but it really is. It's a native native to Colorado. So, uh, and it blooms longer than the 
um, Ridgevacchia does. So that's, a, I believe it's a made through October and it's about 24 inches tall. Oops. Then, then you've got the Retibida, which is our native, um, native plant here. Um, I can't recall the common name. And then Denver Gold Columbine, that's a plant select plant. And this is a nonstop bloomer that's much tougher than, than I ever realized. I've used it in many a garden plantings. So all great yellow plants blooming all season long and they're plants that like drought and, and actually thrive here. So consider subbing out some of maybe your old favorites or um, maybe common recommendations for something like some of these plants. Oops, oops, here we go. Okay, uh, a couple more plant select plants. So um, one thing, a uh, plant I really love is the Agastache or the hyssop plant. Um, these are, uh, they come in multitudes of colors and shapes and sizes, but these three are the plant select varieties that seem to do best with the least amount of care. The Sonoran Sunset, the Coronado, and the Coronado Red. Um, these are all in the mint family, and the mint family tends to do very well out here and, and thrives in drought conditions. If you've ever grown mint, you can vouch for that. Uh, mint it can be what we like to call vigorous. Um, this, that's not to say that these plants are like mint, but um, you tend to see in that family that those plants find water when they need it. And this is just a wonderful um, plant for that. It also does have a, a nice fragrance um, and it blooms later in the summer. So late June, July to October. Um, really easy to care for once it's established, uh, very low water. Um, salvias are also in the mint family and they do very well out here. Um, and you can tell a mint family plant, if you didn't know, you can take, take the stem of the plant and flip it around in your fingers, just roll it around and it'll have four sides. That's how you know it's in the mint family or the Lamy AC family. Um, these are these are wonderful plants. These are all in the plant select program. Some salvias that you find on the market, like May Night, that's a hybrid plant. Um, so it's not as good of a pollinator plant. Um, it's also, you know, so it's sterile, it's it's a hybrid. It's very common. These are more um, native plants. They attract, and so does the, the hyssop also attracts pollinators. Um, they have tubular flowers, which makes them very attractive to hummingbirds and moths and butterflies with the proboscis. Um, and they do come in a lot of colors and varieties. These are just six, but I believe there's eight to 10 of these um, salvias that are available through Plant Select and otherwise. Uh, some are bloomers. Some of them bloom a little bit later. It just depends on the species you choose. I'm gonna jump out of the uh, plant select and just mention a couple other of the mint families because um, like I say they just seem to do very well. Here what you have on the upper left is the plant perennial plant of the year which is stackies. If you remember we talked about lamb's ear. This is the same genus but this is a different species and cultivar. So this is stackies humello and it won the perennial plant of the year. Um, below that, with a, a little pollinator flying by, that's our wild bergamot, Monarda, which is native to Colorado. Um, here in the middle looks like a salvia. On the far right is catmint, Nepeta. There is a Nepeta little trudy that is in uh, the plant select program, but also many other catmints that will do. And here's a close up of one of the um, hyssops or agastache. Um, I believe that is repestious. So all of those are mint family plants and they all do really great and bloom for a long time and, and don't need a lot of water. The next plant family that I love, and this is, well, genus, I should say, is penstemon. And I, I sometimes think penstemon should be our state flower. Uh, columbine is our flower, but we have so many penstemon species. Um, the Rocky Mountain penstemon is one of my top favorites. It's absolutely tough. Um, but there's so many more to choose from. You can see all the color varieties. Um, they all like a rocky soil. They all require a lean soil. If you put compost on these plants, they're not, they're not going to survive and they won't reseed. So um, truly these plants I'm recommending are, are xeric and they like a, a dry and climate with lean soil. Um, these plants are ten, tend to be short-lived 
and they do tend to seed around. They need a, a bit of room in the garden. Um, you can see the picture um, up here, let's see, third from left, blue, uh, the Grand Mesa. It's got some space around it and that plant really likes, um, it's like a rose where it needs air and flow and it, it doesn't want to be crowded out by other plants and shaded. So when you plant that, keep that in mind. It's a great plant for maybe a right-of-way planting or um, along your sidewalk or an edge of, edge of the uh, garden bed could be a good option for you. Okay. Oh, and they're great for high elevations. Although, so if you have your second mountain cabin home, you can <laughs> plant some of those. I get asked a lot of questions about um, dry, shade gardens. So I do want to just touch on that before I talk about some of the shrubs and trees. Um, so the dry shade, um, there, there are quite a few things that will do very well, like say under, under um, a Colorado spruce, or you know if you have a ponderosa pine or something like that and you wanted to grow something under it, these are plants that will work. Um, uh, this is a Brunera, and I want to say it's Siberian blue gloss is the common name, but Brunera you'll find um, commercially available. It has this wonderful um, silver and green leaf and then a beautiful blue bell flower that comes on in the springtime. Very easy to grow. Um, Heuchera here is this purple leafed plant. Sometimes in shade we get less flower, but we get more foliage. So this is a wonderful plant that comes in orange and yellow and purple and almost pinkish red. Lots of colors on the foliage and really tough, tough dry plant. Down beneath that heuchera is the gallium or the sweet woodroof. And this is a real easy ground cover for, again, underneath the spruce. It will actually take underneath the spruce. That can be a hard place to plant, but this is a winner for you. And then anemones happen to be one of my favorites. Uh, they're a pretty big flower. Um, they put on a good show. Their flowers are probably the size of your palm. Um, they come in a couple different colors. They're later bloomers, um, July, um, August, September, and they're a pretty sizable plant, so they'll be two to three feet tall, um, and they tend to spread a little bit, so you want to give them a room or be able to um, split and divide them as needed. And then a couple more for shade and, and dry um, is Alcamilla, which is ladies' mantle. Um, this is on the left here with the yellow bloom in the spring and this really nice palmate flower or sorry, leaf. Um, I have this in my yard and it does great with no help at all. Uh, we talked about the geranium, perennial geranium being a very traditional plant. It will grow in sun, but it will also grow in shade. And this is a wonderful, uh, lots of different varieties of ger the perennial geranium. And then we have Mahonia, um, otherwise known as um, Berberis. I think it recently changed its genus name, uh, but this is uh, a native plant. Um, you'll find it in the sun and you'll find it in the shade. Um, there's a couple different species, but it has a wonderful blueberry and it is a broadleaf evergreen. So you've got some nice color in the winter. And sometimes if you go walking about uh, Red Rocks Park or nature areas, you'll see this plant growing along the trail. Um, so it's really tough and native to our environment. And then there's other cultivars that you can get that have you know more showy ornamental features, but uh, a great plant for your garden. Um, so I wanna talk about um, species and why it's important to think about um, if you are into native uh, gardening, native um, plantings, we wanna think about um, what plants will work better for us here. So, um, and also for pollinators, um, a lot of our pollinators will like our native plants better than they would something that has been produced, hybridized, and cultivated. Everybody is probably familiar with echinacea or coneflower, purple coneflower, upper left here, but that's, that species is purpurea, and the species native to our region is angustifolia. So echinacea angustifolia is going to have the same beautiful flower with the cone head, um, same flower time, same color, but it's going to be drought tolerant and easier to care for. So seems like a winner choice to me. Same with this Leatris spicata. Um, co Cobold is most often uh, marketed, but we actually have Leatris punctata. And that plant, if you overwater it, it won't grow. So it actually just 
want you to leave it alone. You can seed it and it will grow and not need any of your help. So you'll still get that beautiful columnar flower, but you won't have to you know, water it every, every week like you would these other two. So native species can be helpful and some of the plant select um, plants are native species indeed. Um, but I'm gonna kind of go off, off of not just plant select, I'll throw in some more in a minute here, but here's another, um, here's a shrub. Um, commonly it's used as a small tree. Um, this is an amelanchor, um, also known as a service berry. But you can see here the species is Utahensis, which obviously denotes that it is from Utah and therefore is very drought tolerant. But yet it still has, um, this is almost like the viburnum, it has the spring flower, the summer berry, and a beautiful fall color. And it's a woody plant, so it gives you some structure to your garden. So this is a really great, great plant to have, um, but it is a little bit more of a shrub than it is a tree. Um, if you were to buy um, uh, the, the standard um, species, Autumn Brilliance is the cultivar, it would be a larger tree, but it wouldn't be quite as drought tolerant. So think about maybe using the native species. Um, this again is that Mahonia and or Berberis, as you will, um, for dry shade, but it also can take full sun. The picture of the Mahonia on the left is actually uh, Mahonia Fremonti. It's very large. It's a great deterrent if you have, um, let's see, if this is if you're boarding on a public space and you don't want people entering your yard, got some spiky leaves, so it could be a, a good uh, deterrent for you. But here's a Mahonia repens, um, which is a lower growing shade loving plant with some beautiful fall color. And this is an evergreen. You can see it with snow on there. So really nice native um, plants for, for our region. Now this is actually um, not a native to North America, but it is native to a steppe climate. And this is through Plant Select. This is a Russian hawthorn. What we typically see is uh, winter king hawthorns or cultivated hawthorns that are um, either cross hybridized or um, of a different species. But the Crediagus ambigua or Russian hawthorn does extremely well here and shows the same ornamental value. So this would be a great tree for a right of way. You could plant this underneath if you do have wires, you'd have to check with your city and make sure it was approved plant list. But it's a beautiful small tree um, that you could plant for uh, summer, summer fl spring flower rather and summer berry. Nice fall color. Here's another step, um, native step plant. And this is the Eucerian pear. Um, very unknown. Uh, it can be difficult to find, but is totally worth it because what we're finding with emerald ash borer, if you have an ash tree, you, and even if you don't, I'm sure you've heard of the emerald ash borer. Before that, we had, um, you know, Dutch elm disease. And so when we start planting monocultures, we start um, suffering for it, and we see disease, um, you know, start to come at these things. So what this hasn't happened yet, and I, and I don't mean to in, imply that it will, but uh, Chanticleer pears and Bradford pears have been tremendously overused in the industry. They have a, a high probability of breaking because their limbs are so, um, you know, 30 degree angle or less sometimes, so that they can really break in uh, heavy snows. This is a great alternative. This is the Eucerian pear. Again, it has the same, the flower and the fall color, but you can see it's a lot bigger. So this is gonna be a plant that you wouldn't, you wouldn't expect you know, the trunk to be rise above and then have the tree branch out. So this is a, a tree for your yard that would be really nice, but you'd still have that um, wonderful uh, spring bloom that pears give us. Now I am gonna talk about maples. And I'm not trying to get on my soapbox, but I just can't stand seeing plants suffer. <laughs> and I see maples suffer. And I think that uh, part of this is just uh, folks don't know. Um, maples in general, this is in general. Now there are some maples that will do okay up in the mountains. We have a native maple that does well in higher elevations where we get more water and it's less, um, less hot in the summer. Um, but when we try to plant things like sugar maples, 
um, silver maples, there's a lot of them around here. They're really weak wooded, but they, they seem to have survived and are doing okay. But, you know, sugar maples and, and Norway maples, they, they truly, really and truly want the climate that we don't have. They want the exact opposite of what, what Denver, what the West can provide. We have soils that are at least seven and a half in pH. No maple wants that kind of alkaline, alkalinity and they'll show um, chlorosis. So you'll see a lot of yellowing in the leaves. The drought is extremely difficult for these plants. They, they grow in wetter conditions and with much richer soil as well. Typically maples are in a forest. So the leaf litter lends itself to organic matter in the soil. And they, they aren't really great with pollution either. So when we add all those stresses and then throw on pollution and salt and that sort of thing, um, it's really just not good for this tree. You can have a maple in your yard. If you wanna, if you wanna work at it, you can definitely have that. You'll need to water it regularly for its life, for the lifetime of the plant or the tree. And you'll need to fix the soil and fertilize it. And that's, that's okay, but when we start putting them out in places that we aren't caring for them and we're not giving them what they need, they are going to suffer and get sick and, and decline. So if you're going to have a maple, be aware of these things and try and make uh, amendments to um, you know, mediate some of the, the trouble that this tree is going to have out here. And furthermore, I'm going to switch back to plant select and recommend this maple, which is native. Uh, the Tartaricum is actually a native species to the Russian steppe. And this is a beautiful tree. What you're seeing here is the, uh, the Tartarian maple or the Hot Wings maple by Plant Select at Denver Botanic Gardens. And what's red there is the Samsara or the fruit here. So this is the fruiting body of the plant. And it really, that's what makes it the, sort of the hot wings and it, it shows out, stands out really well. And then it has a real nice fall color like all maples do. But this one is really tough and it does great in our environment. So if you're, if you're into maples and you want to have some and you don't want to do all the hard work, this is a great selection. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit more about trees and then we'll take some questions. So trees can be really tough out here. Um, we, our natural environment is um, one that does not have trees unless you're along um, a waterway. You see cottonwoods growing along gulches and, and streams and trees along rivers, but you don't really see them along the plains. So to understand that will help you understand why it's so important to pick the right trees because they're just, they're, they're very difficult to grow out here. This is a great tree, Gymnocladus dioecious, Kentucky coffee tree. Um, one of the best trees for our environment. It actually likes chalk, which is alkaline, it likes drought and it likes city conditions. So this is a no brainer. I mean, these, these plants, these trees are planted um, as number uh, top tree on Denver, city of Denver's forestry list to plant. So really great tree, full size, um, big shade tree for your yard would do well. A lot of folks want to plant um, aspens. These plants actually do a lot better um, higher up than both Denver and Greeley, we, we need a couple more thousand feet and then we can grow these okay. They don't like the heat, they don't like the intensity of the heat, they need more water and snow in the winter. But if you're going to get one and if you really need, need to have this plant, and I understand that, I'm a plant person, prairie gold has been proven to do reasonably well in the plains of Kansas. It's a little bit hard to acquire, but if you can find an aspen prairie gold, you might have better luck with that than any other aspen. Um, and, and then just a quick list, um, you know, realizing that trees are really going to be tough and you're going to need to water them and you're going to need to continue to water them until they're established. But some are better than others, and this is just a short, brief, um, certainly not exhaustive list of trees that, that seem to do pretty well out here based on a study that um, some folks did uh, both at the Denver Botanic Gardens and uh, through the city and did a 60-year survey of all the trees um, and some of these came back as the best performers over those 60 years. So have realistic expectations when you do plant a tree and understand that you'll need to really care for it especially in that first three to five years and if you plant the right one you might be able to 
lay off a little bit after it's established. Okay, I feel like I've talked and talked. Um, so I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna wrap up here and just remind you that here's a couple gardens here that are sort of a Western aesthetic, right? You got some yuccas in here and um, some boulders and some low growing plants and some California poppies. This is a very Western aesthetic. And I think one mistake that we're making when we say, oh, it has to be a xeriscape and that means rock. I think, I think we just need to embrace the plants that do well here, that others that can't grow back in Ohio or, or you know, Indiana or wherever you're from, let's use the plants that really do well to our advantage and leverage what we have and make our aesthetic unique to our, our region. So when you're designing and thinking about planting, be aware of the soils, be aware of our climate. Think about how we're also in an urban setting and that can be even more stressful for these plants. So the tougher they are for our climate, the better. Um, and think about, you know, prepping your soil and mulching, just as, it's just as important as selecting the right plant. And then knowing your plants. Uh, plant Select is great. Please use that resource, it's um, plantselect.org. Natives are excellent. Um, come visit us at the gardens. We are hoping to reopen the season. We'll keep you posted, um, but it's a great way to, you know, take notes on plants that you think that are really neat, and you can visit the Rose Water Smart Garden or a Step Garden and, and so many of the others that are, are drought tolerant. Um, I hope this has been helpful. I'm so glad I could join you today. Um, my email's down there at the bottom. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them now. So I'm going to go ahead and um, Let's see, I think I'm just gonna have Jen come on so she can help me field any questions that, that you might have. Thank you so much. Sure, I'll start with the first question. It is from Megan Rhodes. Does squeegee work for all plants or only native plants and low water plants? Great question. Squeegee will work for xeric plants and native plants. If you were to plant say a hydrangea, and put squeegee in it, that is not gonna help that hydrangea. So when you use squeegee, the purpose of that is to provide a plant with aeration and uh, to their roots. So you would only use that for, um, like I said, step plants, natives, xeric, anything plants select. But if you were gonna plant a tree, for example, you wouldn't need to use squeegee for the, the tree. Um, certain shrubs can benefit, but it does depend on the species. But if you're planting a xeric garden, you can do you can do squeegee for all of those plants if they're xeric. Where do I find dog tough grass? Great question. Um, it, there's a several vendors, and this is what I would advise. Um, we try not to uh, Denver Botanic Gardens tries not to promote other you know uh, retailers and such. But if you go to PlantSelect.org, you can. There's a special link just for dog tough. And you can click on dog tough and they'll say, here's where you, who's, who's providing it, where you can find it. And there's even a whole entire website just dedicated to dog tough. So go to plantselect.org and um, they'll look up the dog tough there and they'll tell you exactly where you can find it, who you can buy it from, when to install it, all of those questions. I hope that helps. Are okay. the garden in the box plant select plants? The garden and the box plants are not plant select exclusively, I do not believe. Their program is excellent and we are talking with them and we've worked with them on some programs. They come to our plant select events. Um, I, I don't believe we've developed a design with them, um, but that's something that actually has been thought of. Um, there are plant select designs on the website and uh, you can download those if you are looking for a plant select, but I think Resource Central does an excellent job uh, garden in a box for, for xeric plantings. Next question is from Veronica. Which dry shade plants are best to keep rabbits away or are rabbit tar tolerant? Can I plant dry shade underneath a tree? Yes, you can plant dry shade under a tree and I have to get back to you. I. Uh, you know, we have um, we have rabbits at the gardens um, and our Brunera seems to look really amazing. So does our gallium, but I'd really, can I get her email and email her back with those answers? Cause I'm not sure. Next question is from Carla. 
Is there any place that we can walk on to for some dog tough grass? Yeah, um, actually, well, I mean, I know things are a little bit odd right now, so it's sort of uncharted, but I, I do believe that um, the Boulder, um, I think it's the Boulder County Extension Office has the, the whole back of their building is dog tough. They installed it a couple of years ago. So if you visit the extension office there, um, there's there's a space where you can walk on the grass and touch it and feel it. We have some at the gardens. It's in the step garden. It's in our step garden. Of course, we're not open right now, but we will be. Um, we don't know when you'll have to stand by. Um, so when you come to the gardens, come to the step gardens and you'll see a patch of grass um, and it should have a tag that says dog tough. Otherwise you might be able to, typically it's sold in plugs. So there would be a, a green you know, top to the plant so you could feel it that way if you wanted to test that. So when they sell it, it's not just in a seed. Where do I keep weeds out of an Xeriscape garden? Oh, uh, well, that's a great question. Uh, weed control is a, a big issue. One of the great things about a zero escape garden is you're not watering it as much, so you're getting fewer weeds. Furthermore, if you put down rock mulch, the weeds don't like that as much as they do regular, you know, shredded wood mulch. So there's two advantages there. But initially, you want to make sure that you, um, before you plant, you address your weed issues. So you can either use a chemical safely and following the instructions, or you can solarize your yard. Um, and I would go to xerces.org and that's spelled X-E-R-C-E-S dot org. And they have information on how to solarize um, and de-weed an area. Um, otherwise you, you do just have to hand pick um, and just pick those weeds. The other thing I would say is please don't rototill. You're just gonna bring up more weed seeds. So do not attempt to just turn the soil because all you're doing is bringing up more weed seeds. Next question is from Madeline. What type of native turf grasses can tolerate both semi-shade as well as full sun exposure? Um, I think probably fescue. A fescue would be a good choice and buffalo grass would be two native grasses that would do part shade and, and some full sun. Um, and in the fescue, uh, you could either do red fescue or um, Festuca obscura. Uh, and, and let me just tell you, you can go to Colorado Springs uh, Utilities dot, uh, dot org, I believe it is, or you can Google, C, uh, I would go to CSU and they have um, native grasses and they have a PDF on native grasses. So CSU or Colorado Springs Utilities both have really informational PDFs on turf and uh, turf replacement options. The next question is from Russ. I realize now it might be best for me to hire an expert instead of doing this project myself. Please advise where I should start with the plan to hire someone to help me convert my bluegrass yard into an Xeriscape yard. Yay, first of all, thanks for doing that. Yay. Um, second of all, I'm going to direct you to Plant Select um, because once again, they are a great resource. They have actual landscape contractors listed on their um, on their website. So you can go and make sure that they, if they work with Plant Select, then they're familiar, they should be familiar with um, the Xeriscape principles. So you can go on there and those are retail professionals or, or you know, commercially available folks to help you. So they should have a list on Plant Select. Good luck. Next question is from Sarah. Are the plants in pretty tough plants appropriate for Leadville? Um, yes, yes they are. Um, so one of the things when you, when you look at that book actually, and when you go to the website, what you'll find is we have a list of, um, there's an Excel sheet that you can download for free with a list of all the plants that we have in Plant Select that are pretty tough plants. Um, and it'll tell you elevations and the limit for the elevation. It'll tell you if it's native. It'll tell you if it's susceptible to rabbits and pests. So um, yes, there are certainly plants appropriate for Leadville and then you could look specifically for 
those detailed questions on the Excel sheet at plantselect.org. I think maybe next time I'll, I'll have to do a live uh, exploration of Plant Select because I think it could be really helpful for everyone. Next question is from Greg. Should we add squeegee to our topsoil for our garden in a box? Yes, yes you should. And the way you can do that is when you dig the hole for the plant that you receive, when, whatever you dig out, you can mix in just a handful of the squeegee into the backfill, right? So whatever you're gonna put back into the hole, you add the squeegee to. You could put a little bit of the squeegee at the bottom of the hole as well, before you put the plant in, then put the plant in and then mix in some of that squeegee with that backfill and then fill it in. And then mulch that area with the squeegee on top with about one inch layer to stop the weeds. Next question is from Kaylin. I planted Coronados the past two years and they haven't come back. Any thoughts on what might be the issue or a possible replacement? Sure. Um, well, there could be a lot of things. Um, I would wonder what the soil's like. Is it getting enough drainage? Those plants do need drainage. And if you just put it directly in the soil without adding uh, something to aerate, um, it could be dying out and rotting over winter. Because over winter, too, when they get wet and they're wet at the bottom and there's snow, they'll often die out. So they do need the drainage. Um, it could be, I don't know if there's animals trampling or if it's near place where dogs are going by and that could be a problem. Uh, it does need full sun and then what shape are they when you get them? A um, lot of different things but I first thing I would guess is drainage. Fixing the soil up with, with squeegee. Next question is from Stephanie. What ornamental grasses do you recommend? Oh there's a whole lot of ornamental grasses yes and I recommend them in every garden because they create that winter interest. Right now, my favorite is standing ovation. It's a blue stem, little blue stem, and that's part of the plant select program. Little blue stem or shizacrium is a native grass to Colorado Plains. Um, so that will do really well with low water and is easy to establish and has great fall color. There's another plant called Blonde Ambition, and it's a form of Budalea, which is also a native grass, a very popular. Um, it's a little bit uh, shorter than the shizacrium. There should be several plants on that plant select program um, on the website to choose from for, for grasses, but those are my top two. And then we'll do two more questions. Okay. This next question is from Deborah. I have a large country space. How can I best sow seeds to grow a butterfly and pollinator friendly, large maintenance free plot? That's a tough question because um, it's actually one of the projects that I'm piloting right now. So if you were to come to the gardens when we do open, we have a prairie garden and we haven't watered it in 20 years. The trick to having a prairie garden, and so this would be something you do in like a you know five acre space or you have a lot of land where you just want to seed, it really, it's, it's going to take some maintenance. It will always take some maintenance because it's not a native landscape. Um, the first thing you're going to need to do is control the weeds and get rid of them. The second thing you'll need to do is establish the grasses first before you establish any forbs. And the reason you establish the grasses is so that you can control the weeds better. Um, you can spray um, the grasses with a broadleaf herbicide and the grasses will survive and you'll get them to establish and you'll have a chance to um, get rid of those weeds so that once the grasses are established, then you go ahead and seed the forbs and the, and the um, uh, perennials and so on. Uh, there, it's a tricky. That's a tricky thing, and I might, I might suggest that you reach out to a professional to get some advice on that. Um, and you can also just email me, and I could try and send you a PDF of of some resources for you. Great. Last question: How do we repel rabbits from eating our plants? <laughs> get a dog. <laughs> Oh, it's hard. It's really tough. Um, and guys, there's no solution that's like full foolproof um, or rabbit proof. Uh, we we deal with it at the gardens. Um, we struggle with it. Um, you really just you have to pick plants that they prefer less. Um, there's not always going to be plants that 
uh, that, I mean, sometimes they'll eat anything. It's like a deer. They'll just eat anything because they're that hungry. Um, but you could be thoughtful about the, the plants that you're putting in and make sure that they're not the plants that rabbits prefer. But really, you can't, you can try um, fencing, but they tend to dig and they'll get under the fence. So you have to bury the fence. Um, it really is helpful to have a dog or a cat. Um, but there's, you probably just want to look up some species that are a little bit more tolerant. And and again, I would have to get back. I'd have to get back to you. Somebody asked me about the dry shade and and rabbits, and it's just tough. Um, rabbits are just one of those pests that we all have to deal with. So um, I could probably I would go up to I would go to CSU and go, uh, see if they have a, a list of plants that are uh, pest free, rabbit proof um, plants that do well and don't attract rabbits. Mm -hmm.